Lolita was studying a road map when I got back into the car. What did that man ask you, Lo? Man? Oh, that man. Oh, yes. Oh, I don't know. He, he wondered if I had a map. Lost his way, I guess. We drove on, and I said, Now listen, Lo. I do not know whether you are lying or not. I do not know whether you are insane or not, and I do not care for the moment, but that person has been following us all day, and his car was at the motel yesterday, and I think he is a cop. You know perfectly well what would happen and where you will go if the police find out about things. Now, I want to know exactly what he said to you and what you told him. If he's really a cop, she said shrilly but not illogically, the worst thing we could do would be to show him we're scared. Ignore him, Dad. Did he ask where we were going? Oh, he knows that, mocking me. Anyway, I said, giving up. I've seen his face now. He's not pretty. He looks exactly like a relative of mine called Trap. Perhaps he is Trap. Oh, if I were you. Oh, look, all the nines are changing into the next thousand. When I was a little kid, she continued unexpectedly, I used to think they'd stop and go back to nines if only my mother agreed to put the car in reverse. It was the first time, I think, she spoke spontaneously of her pre-Humbertian childhood. Perhaps the theatre had taught her that trick. And silently we travelled on, unpursued. But the next day, like pain in a fatal disease that comes back as the drug and hope wear off, there it was again behind us, that glossy red beast. The traffic on the highway was light that day. Nobody passed anybody, and nobody attempted to get in between our humble blue car and its imperious red shadow, as if there were some spell cast on that interspace, a zone of evil mirth and magic, a zone whose very precision and stability had a glass-like virtue that was almost artistic. The driver behind me, with his stuffed shoulders and trappish moustache, looked like a display dummy, and his convertible seemed to move only because an invisible rope of silent silk connected it with our shabby vehicle. We were so many times weaker than his splendid lacquered machine, so that I didn't even attempt to outspeed him. O oh, lente carite noctis equi, O oh, softly run nightmares. We climbed long grades and rolled downhill again and heeded speed limits and spared slow children and reproduced in sweeping terms the black wiggles of curves on their yellow shields. And no matter how and where we drove, the enchanted interspace slid on intact, mathematical, mirage-like, the viatic counterpart of a magic carpet. And all the time I was aware of a private blaze on my right, her joyful eye, her flaming cheek. A traffic policeman, deep in the nightmare of crisscross streets, at half-past four p.m. in a factory town, was the hand of chance that interrupted the spell. He beckoned me on, and then, with the same hand, cut off my shadow. A score of cars were launched in between us, and I sped on and deftly turned into a narrow lane. A sparrow alighted with a jumbo breadcrumb, was tackled by another, and lost the crumb. When, after a few grim stoppages, and a bit of deliberate meandering I returned to the highway, our shadow had disappeared. Lola snorted and said, If he is what you think he is, how silly to give him the slip. I have other notions by now, I said. You should uh, check them up by uh, keeping in touch with him, father dear, said Lo, writhing in the coils of her own sarcasm. Gee, you are mean, she added in her ordinary voice. We spent a grim night in a very foul cabin under a sonorous amplitude of rain and with a kind of prehistorically loud thunder incessantly rolling above us. I am not a lady and I do not like lightning, said Lo, whose dread of electric storms gave me some pathetic solace. We had breakfast in the township of Soda, Pop 1001. Judging by the terminal figure, I remarked, Fat Face is already here. Your humour, said Lo, is side-splitting, dear father. We were in sagebrush country by that time, and there was a day or two of lovely release. I had been a fool, all was well. That discomfort was merely a trapped flatters. And presently the mesas gave way to real mountains, and on time we drove into wastes. Oh, disaster! Some confusion had occurred. She had misread the date in the tour book, and the magic cave ceremonies were over. She took it bravely, I must admit. And when we discovered there was in Kurortish Waste a summer theatre in full swing, we naturally drifted toward it one fair mid-June evening. 
I really could not tell you the plot of the play we saw, a trivial affair, no doubt, with self-conscious light effects and a mediocre leading lady. The only detail that pleased me was a garland of seven little graces, more or less immobile, prettily painted, bare-limbed, seven bemused, pubescent girls in coloured gauze that had been recruited locally, judging by the partisan flurry here and there among the audience, and were supposed to represent a living rainbow, which lingered throughout the last act and rather teasingly faded behind a series of multiplied veils. I remember thinking that this idea of children colours had been lifted by authors Claire Quilty and Vivian Darkbloom from a passage in James Joyce, and that two of the colours were quite exasperatingly lovely, Orange, who kept fidgeting all the time, and Emerald, who, when her eyes got used to the pitch-black pit where we were all heavily sat, suddenly smiled at her mother or her protector. As soon as the thing was over, and manual applause, a sound my nerves cannot stand, began to crash all around me, I started to pull and push low toward the exit, in my so natural amorous impatience to get her back to our neon-blue cottage in the stunned, starry night. I always say nature is stunned by the sight she sees. Dolly Lowe, however, lagged behind in a rosy daze, her pleased eyes narrowed, her sense of vision swamping the rest of her senses to such an extent that her limp hands hardly came together at all in the mechanical action of clapping they still went through. I had seen that kind of thing in children before, but, by God, this was a special child, myopically beaming at the already remote stage where I glimpsed something of the joint authors, a man's tuxedo and the bare shoulders of a hawk-like, black-haired, strikingly tall woman.' 